going to be talking about issuing and verifying your own Microsoft Entra verified IDs. Now, verified IDs, I'm going to explain over a period of time, what is Microsoft Entra? And this was a bit of a surprise that happened a few months ago. We have Azure, and then we have Azure AD. And AD is the core identity and access management uh, component, if you like, of Azure. And of course, it's the heart of Microsoft 365. And Microsoft then bought permission management. So, and they also had verified IDs. Actually, at that stage, it was called verifiable credentials. So they decided to do a rebrand, as Microsoft likes to do on a very regular basis. And they called it Microsoft Entra. It includes the Azure AD. Right? It includes permission management and it includes a verified ID. Okay, so that's what Entra is. What is verified ID? I will come to in a second. Great news is I have actually been speaking about decentralized identity. I've been speaking about uh, verifiable credentials, which is where verified IDs came from, since around um, to 2018. I think actually I did a presentation in 2017 on it. This has been a long period of time until finally uh, on the 8th of the 8th this year, it went into general availability. So the service is there now and it's available to be used. What I want as a key session takeaway, first part of the session, I'm and the timing seems to be all a bit weird now because the, you know, when we started, et cetera, first part will be around about half an hour. And in that first half, what I want to do is tell you exactly what a verified ID is, all right? And then what we'll do is we'll look in the next session about how Microsoft gives you the services so you can issue and verify your IDs, all right? So we'll go, go through that and also some usage scenarios as well. So that'll be in part two. So when we break, what I'd like you to do is discuss what we've talked about in part one, or what I've talked about in part one. See if you've got any questions, come back to part two with your questions. And then when we finish, what would be really great is if you can see a use for verified IDs in your environment, so in your organization, where they might fit and, and how they might be adopted. And I think uh, Jack's even got a prize. We, if we, someone comes up with a really great idea, Jack is gonna be the judge of this one, I think. Um, so just to give you a bit of background on myself, um, I started uh, designing uh, real-time systems and real-time controllers going at very fast rates, so 10,000 millimeters per second. Uh, on a production line, production line goes into a complete blur. You can't see anything at that speed. And what you have to do is guarantee the thing works, because right? if it doesn't, at 10,000 millimeters per second, boy, does it make a mess if it goes wrong. So I was working on uh, developing real-time systems for risk-based controllers. So we were selecting the risk hardware as well. And what we wanted was a management front end to this. And um, somebody said, what about Windows? And I actually looked at every single version of Windows. And uh, the first early versions of Windows, uh, the work I did with them was basically taking the stack of floppies and, and putting it fairly near the bin. I won't say exactly what I did with them, but Windows NT came along and yes, we could use this. I got working with a product group in Redmond, so Microsoft product group in Redmond on NT. And one day somebody said to me from the product group, why didn't you have a look at this? And this was a very early precursor for what was to become on-premise Active Directory. And then in uh, about 1999, I got a phone call from Microsoft U UK and they said, um, we hear you know something about Active Directory. And I'm going, uh, why are they asking me? And they said, the next thing is they said, will you come out and tell us about it? Because I've worked with the product group, I've fed back in it. I knew any more than any of their guys. Actually, there were some very bright guys that knew almost as much as I did. Probably they hadn't had the engagement, though, with the product group at that stage. So I got a, a very close relationship with Microsoft at that stage. Um, I've worked in various uh, parts of Microsoft around the world uh, in terms of consulting. I never got assimilated by the Borg. I managed to stay back from that. 
Um, and um, I started specializing in identity systems in terms of federated identity systems around uh, 2002. Um, nothing to do with Microsoft at that stage. And then um, I got uh, you know, involved in Active Directory Federation services and, and all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, presenting since 1999, there's a picture of me someone took in 2001. I, I don't think I look a day older. <laughs> At least that's what I tell myself. Um, and then I presented around the world all over the place, doing lots of, having lots of fun. One, one of the things I have absolute passion about trying to take complicated stuff and making it easy to understand. And that's my main aim. And I just love this Charles Mingus quote, which is making the complicated simple, awesomely simple. That's creativity. And that, that's what I aim for. I'm always looking at new ways of presenting things. And I got a phone call from my son um, oh, a few months back and he said, oh, can I come and see you this weekend, dad? And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, it's a bit late in the week, why is he? I, I said, what for? He said, I want to go and see Fat Boy Slim on Brighton Beach. And I thought, okay, that's why he's coming down. And then he said to me, he said, do you want to come too? And I thought about it for a few seconds and I said, Yes, and I can then hear the dead silence, <laughs> pins dropping, you know, the clatter of pins. And anyway, we, we had the most amazing evening um, watching Fat Boy Slim. I just thought he was amazing. Fatboy, I mean, I'd never seen him live before, you know, eat, sleep, rave, repeat. And I thought, gosh, could I adopt this for the presentation? Eat, sleep, identity, repeat. Heat. And it, it didn't really work, but I tried to get on stage with him, but that didn't work. But I did make it to the video wall. <laughs> anyway, repeat, repeat, repeat. This is something we do all our lives when it comes to identity. And if you think about it, you join a school and you know, we've got somebody being onboarded for the school and they're probably going to be put into some sort of identity store of some kind. And probably the parents are turning up to prove who, oh, we got Eric here, who prove who Eric is and, you know, his address and his age and all sorts of bits and pieces. And then Eric goes through school. As he goes through school, he's doing various projects. Where's that information stored? In that identity store. Then he does his exams. Where's that information? in that identity store. Then he goes to college and suddenly he's going through this whole process again. And he needs to pr have proof that he passed his exams. All right, well, how's that done? Probably paper presenting some form of document. And then he goes to work and exactly the same process. And then you go to a financial institution, exactly the same process. You go to another bank, another savings uh, society of some kind, again, exactly the same process. And if you think about it, how many times are you proving exactly the same thing to yet another organization? Right? Many, many, many times. And then there's another issue is that Eric doesn't own what's in the school identity store. All the information about him is in the school identity store. Same with college, same with work. So what we're doing as we go through life is we're leaving these silos of identity. And what we need to do is change all of that and come up with a new paradigm. And here, we have Eric, and he becomes the holder. And what's he the custodian of? His own information about himself, right? And then what we have is we have issuers that can produce information about Eric and bind it to Eric's identity. So the school, when he passes an exam, you know, that's now held uh, in information that can be bound with Eric's identity. Who's the custodian of the identity? It's Eric, right? And then what will happen is Eric will present that proof, whatever it might contain, to what's called verifiers or relying parties. So we could have maybe, and this is the, the challenge, is people have to trust these issuers. So who are the issuers, right? It could be a government organization. It could be a bank. Right? Or it could be an identity proofing service. 
right? And then, so Eric now holds, and this is called a verifiable credential or verified ID, which he holds information about his identity. So absolutely concrete proof that he lives at a certain address. This is his picture. Um, and then what will happen is that information will be digitally signed by the issuer and can be presented by Eric. All right, so now Eric goes to one identity proofing service and in theory, he could present that same information to multiple organizations. And that's the where we want to move to. And what I've got is a, uh, a little demo of onboarding uh, a new new employee and because <clears throat> i've i've had challenges with the service and also the internet time i've actually recorded i pre-recorded this so we can see it so the idea is here is we we hit a company called woodgrove and we are going to be onboarded to woodgrove and so we put in some basic information about ourselves or hr does that so here we are we got matthew and then we say to Matthew, look, we need to know your address. We need to know your references. We need to know this, that, and the other. You go and see the company that deals with the identity proofing for us. We're not going to do it. We're going to send you off to your company. So Matthew goes off to uh, the company and he's going to True Identity. And he arrives at True Identity and starts the process. Now, what True Identity will do is be asking for all sorts of identity proofs of some kind. They could ask Matthew to go in there and actually turn up and be, you know, proofed up by actually presenting himself. Or he could take various other bits of information or send them, whatever's the method. So here, um, it's, he's going to take a selfie. So he uploads the selfie. He uploads uh, a government ID, so he's going to do that as well. And um, once that's uploaded, what will happen now is that information will be verified. And we've now verified all of the information about Matthew and whatever is required in that requirement. The next job is we go on and uh, we need um, Matthew to be able to pick up this information. Right now, this is the, the very clever bit is that Matthew generates his own digital identity and we'll see how he does that in a minute. So we're not binding this to the digital identity for that user from true identity. We're not binding it to a Google identity and a zero AD identity. We're binding it to an identity that Matthew has generated. And what we'll see how it's called a decentralized identity. We'll see how that works in a moment. So now he's going to take out his um, his authenticator because that's where he's going to store this information. And he's going to go here and he's going to scan that QR code. And the QR code is just a link to the service. The authenticator can go and pick up the information. Now, Matthew has to prove who he is, so he's been given a pin. All right now, we could we could get Matthew to prove in all sorts of ways. The pin is on the website. We could send the, the pin in a separate email. We could send the pin, you know, secure digital printing where he has to peel off the strip and see it. So he's putting in the pin number now, and he's going to pick up this digital identity. So there it is, and. This has got all the information that has been proofed for him by true identity. So there he is, you know, he's Matthew's his address, he's over 21, etc. All right. And that is digitally bound now to Matthew's identity that he created. Now he's storing this information. So now having done that, what he does is he, he can obviously click on the activity. There's the activity audit trail. You can see that. And he can shoot back over to uh, Woodrow. And now he arrives at Woodrow and he presents that verified credential. And to do that, again, what Woodrow does is generates a QR code, which is basically going, this is referred to as a presentation request. It's going to ask for a particular credential to be presented. So 
He scans the QR code and uses the authenticator again to do that. And so we're going to scan the QR code there. And now he's being asked is, do you want to share true identity? Who with Woodgrove? And that's been a verified identity of Woodgrove. And he says, yeah, I'm quite happy to do that. So I'm going to share that. And having, having shared that, um, we can complete the onboarding process. So again, we can see the activity. So it was issued, it's now been shared, and now we can complete the onboarding. And now he's onboarded. Now, um, having onboarded, what he'll need to do is get some sort of credential to say that he's now a verified employee, all right? So what the next job that happens is Woodgrove presents him with a, an issuance. And here, uh, we're going to scan again. And in this particular demo, uh, Woodgrove have actually given him a QR code. Now, what could have happened, and, and we'll see this later, what could have happened is he could have actually been given an account with Woodgrove. He could have logged in with Woodgrove and then done the issuance through a secure login, which could be a multi-factor login, all right, to get that. But we're just putting in the um, code in here, say 33827, picking that up. And now we've got an verified employee card again, um, you know, and uh, we can use that whenever we need to. So, for instance, he visits the equipment store and uh, arrives at the equipment store and he's going, oh, yeah, I need a discount. And I could log in or I can prove, I can provide a verifiable credential of this. So this is now Prosware saying, please present me with a verified ID from your company. So that again is going to be scanned. Having scanned it, he will be asked if he wants to present it. So he's saying, yes, I do want to present it. And if we look at it, we can see that our activity, if we've now presented it to Prosware, and we can see that we've got our discount, All right? So that takes you through a full potential sort of example of onboarding a user and how they might use the credential. So, but if you think about it, isn't that the way it's always been done? This is interesting acoustic. Um, so for those who are not in the room, it's raining. <laughs> so um, if you think about it, you know, Sally's driving along in her car and suddenly a police officer jumps out and stops her and he wants proof that she can actually drive. So what does she do? She presents her driving license. Where did she get it from? Her wallet. Who looks after her driving license? She does. Right? So she presents the thing and the policeman goes through a process of looking at this and says, OK, so you're allowed to drive. I trust that because I trust your identity, the photo. Where did that come from? It's her photo. It's her identity. All right. Um, and I trust everything it says about you. So the claims that you can drive your sports car and everything else. Um, why? Because this has been issued by the driving license authority and i trust them okay of course the police will probably do a secondary check these days but in principle that's the way it works now the beauty of this is sally holds that card in her wallet and she can present it under all sorts of different circumstances yes i'm a driver yes i'm over 18 i can get into this nightclub all right, or maybe over 21, you know, whatever you need to be. So you can present that whenever it's needed, all right? So that's, you know, what it, how it's been done for years and years. You're a doctor, you might have a, you know, little card to prove it, all right? And then um, if you look at the components of that, what you have is the subject, all right? You have the claims, you have the issuer, who is basically checked out this subject and said, yeah, this subject is allowed to drive, because why? Well, we've got the examiner's report that says this person's allowed to drive. And then what we need to do is we need to push it into a tamper-proof um, envelope of some kind. So it's tamper evident.
And what we need to do is take that digital. Okay. So that's our aim. And, and by the way, if you're familiar or you know anything that there are, there's a sort of standard under development for a mobile driving license, right? Which is, this is not the mobile driving license standard. This is me using this to actually explain a verifiable credential. Okay. So don't, don't say, well, the mobile driving license does it differently. Yes, it does. Right. This is uh, this is by way. I mean, I could have used a doctor's card or a, something else. Just you know, driving license is something everyone can relate to. So now, uh, what we've got is we've got an issuer, right? So that's the driving license authority. We've got a holder. In this case, it's become Eric, but I guess it should have been Sally. All right, and then we've got the police officer who is the the verifier. Each one of those needs a digital identity. Right? And what we use for them is a decentralized identifier. Decentralized meaning it is not held in any central store. You know, if you go to Gmail, where's the identity? It's in Google, right? You go to Microsoft 365, where's the identity? It's in Azure AD, right? And a de decentralized identifier uh, is not actually held by anyone apart from the person that it belongs to. Right? We'll get into more detail of that in a second. So if, if, if Eric needs a did, automatically generated for Eric, right? If the issuer needs a did, automatically generated. Now it's all do with crypto. So public private key pairs, the private key pair, sorry, the private key is securely held in a wallet and never ever leaves the wallet. And that's absolutely vital. If you lose your private key, you're in trouble. Right, so it sits in the wallet, never leaving there. And then what we've got is the private key is actually used to sign messages. Now, if you're not familiar with public private key pairs, um, just to sort of make sure we're all on the same track, private key, private key how's it generated? It's a random number, if you like, very clever maths that goes into the generation. We use entropy to randomize the generation of this number. It's in the most enormous, you know, uh, address space. And if you think about it, it's, you know, all the grains of sand in the world is not big enough to represent the address space. All the stars in the, you know, the cosmos is not big enough. It, it's enormous address space. So the chances of two private keys having the same number is virtually zero. For all intents and purposes, it's treated as zero. So from the private key, we take that and we store it really, really securely. And then what we do is from the private key, we generate a public key. That public key never ever, um, it, sorry, if you take the public key, you cannot reverse it. You cannot find the private key. So the private key is generated the once and from that, the public key is generated. Public key, we give to anyone that needs to verify when we sign something. So we take a message and we sign it using the private key. That we give to someone and they can validate the signature using the public key, right? So what do we get from validating the signature? Just two things and two things only. Number one, the person that signed it is in possession of the private key. In possession of the private key. I put owner in there, but you know, that's a, that's a, we could talk, discuss that for ages, but they, in, they were in possession of the private key. And number two, the message has not been tampered with because if it had been tampered with, the signature would fail. So now we know the person who signed this has the private key and the message has not been tampered with. So that's, that's a really good position to be in. So what we need is a way of distributing the public key. And to do that with a decentralized identity, what we have is what's called a did document. And inside that did document are your pro the public keys. I think I might have said, sorry, if I said, we're a way of distributing, did I say a way of distributing the private key? I have a horror feeling I did. I meant 
distributing the public key. And there's the public key inside this did document, right? This strange number here, I'll come back to in a second. But this is a, uh, a did identifier that f lets you find this did document. Okay, so what do we do with the did documents? We've somehow got to make them available. So we need to publish them, right? So there are two sort of ways of publishing them. Uh, we could put them on a ledger, right? And it could be a centralized control ledger, but that breaks everything. So we need to use a decentralized ledger technology, such as blockchain, right? So no one actually owns the chain. It's, it's built through consensus. So it could be published on a blockchain ledger of some kind, all right? That's one possible method of doing it. The other place that you could put it is you could put it in the entity's DNS namespace. So I'm a bank, all right? Oh, well, let's say HSBC. I shouldn't, shouldn't yeah, advertise them, but anyway. Um, we're, we're, we're a bank, we've got our namespace. All right, and somebody wants to get our public key, why not put it on our website? So there's our did document on the website. So that's a possibility. Now, Microsoft um, support two ways of actually publishing did documents. You can publish them in the DNS namespace, and that's referred to as did web, or you can publish them on what's called the iron overlay network. Um, which is a network which has been designed, it's, it's called a side tree network. It actually sits on top of uh, Bitcoin, right? And if you, if you published each did into, um, uh, into actually Bitcoin itself, um, you could only publish it by reference. So you need to store the did document somewhere because you, you can't get it on, on the Bitcoin network. But the problem is it's slow. Bitcoin network, you know, transactions only get committed every now and again. And there's a huge cost involved from mining and everything else. So rather than doing that, the iron overlay network is it accumulates a whole bunch of dids, all right, puts them in a file and then anchors the file on the underlying uh, blockchain network. All right. And that's how iron actually works. Um, it actually uses the interplanetary file system, if you, if you know it, to store, to batch up these did documents and then anchor them. And by anchoring them, it means they can't be tampered with. So two ways of doing it. Now, um, if you look at a did, it consists of two components, the unique number, which was that number that was pointing at the did document and the did document. If you break this unique number down, you have starts did, the next thing is the method, which says wh on what is the underlying platform that is storing the did document. And then you've got a unique identifier for the underlying platform. So in this situation here, uh, you know, if it was sitting on Bitcoin, it could be BTCR, all right, as the method, which is this one here. Um, you've got Sovereign, you've got Ethereum, um, but in terms of Microsoft, it's either iron, right, which is storing it on the identity overlay network, which is anchored in uh, Bitcoin, or it's web, in which case the document is on somebody's website somewhere. We'll have to find out where in a minute. And then the did document, uh, what you've got in there, the, the, the really important thing is the public keys for verification. But there's service endpoints and other bits and pieces that can go in there. All right. And that's, a, a, if you're familiar with JSON, that's a JSON document. Now, um, in terms of did web, we are basically taking this did document, we're putting it on our website. Where? Well, the format is did web followed by your domain name. So if I go did web hr.xtshub.com, right, that's my domain name. So that's the namespace that's stored in. Where is it stored? It's stored in uh, a, a folder uh, dot well dash known, and it's did dot JSON as a document. So that's where my did document is. Right? Um, you can specify paths and port numbers, so you can have multiple did documents for one particular DNS namespace. So you, you can support that. 
So how do you find the public key? Go to the website, download it, all right? Or there's another method as well, which I'll come to. There's a, um, a well, there's a whole long form did. What it is, that's the short form did up to a colon. This one beginning EY, if anyone's familiar with JSON, it's actually JSON web token format. And that is the actual um, did document, the rest of it there. The whole thing together is called the long form did, all right? But if you've got it anchored on an underlying technology such as iron or did web, all you need is the front bit, all right? The authenticator, because that did belongs to the user of the authenticator app, doesn't actually store or anchor the did anywhere. It doesn't need to. It uses the long form did, so the whole thing. And it's also, you know, it's, uh, it's referred to as a long form did or an unanchored did. So, so that, that's the, the, the did. Now, in, in the future, you'll have, uh, you'll have sort of universal did resolvers. So you want to find where the document is, you just throw this thing at the universal did resolver. And what it will do is it use the appropriate method driver to find it wherever it might be. So it could be on ARN, it could be on Bitcoin, it could be on Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. And in there, I've got the, the DNS namespace. For the moment, uh, Microsoft has a resolver that works across. Um, it, it works across Iron. It works across uh, uh, Did Web as well. And then what you've got is you've got um, Iron Explorer is available as well if you if you want to play with these things. And what I'll do is just give you a, a very quick uh, demo of that in a second. But before I do, the other thing is you've got a document, but actually, who's it belong to? If it's on, you know, the HSBC website, you could say, oh, it belongs to HSBC. But does it really? What you can do is you can put a link inside the document, uh, which actually says this belongs to this DNS name. So you can actually identify the organization by the link. If the thing's stored on ARN, right, you've got no, it's not in a DNS namespace, but you can have a link in there to a DNS namespace that says this doc belongs to that organization, right? So there's the, and, and that the, the link domains can go in there. Again, how do you deal with it? You put a document in the DNS namespace. So up on your website at a particular location, good old dot well known again. Okay, let's uh, let's just have a, a quick look at that. And again, um, so this is um, in looking in the, the Microsoft portal. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I've got an organization set up here. And this one has, so this is an issuer. It's an issuer service and a verifier service, and it has a digital identity. And this time it's did web. Okay, so it's didweb hr.xtshub.com. So let's just uh, copy that and let's drop that uh, in, just into Notepad to make life easier. So we can use the resolver, but we could equally well go straight to the DNS namespace, i.e., the website, to pull the document. So that's that one there. So let's actually go and try that. So this is using their resolver. And uh, just use a, a incognito window for here, drop that in, and brings back the did document. And what you can see is the public keys uh, in the did document. So that's using the resolver to do it. But, uh, and that's also linked. The link domain is saying this did belongs to hr.xdshub.com. So we've, we've got that capability there. And um, then if we uh, take uh, uh, this one here, you'll find it just brings back the same document because we're going straight into that location. So we didn't actually need to use the resolver in this case. But if we go to another organization, and this organization is set up to use iron, okay? So this is did iron in this case. And, and what we'll do is we'll pick up this did, 
and it's actually a long form did, uh, which is shown up there. And we can grab the short form, um, which is actually just up to the colon. So we can grab that and we can pop that into here. I'll just drop it in to here so we can use it. So this is going to be using the uh, resolver. So this is short form. We haven't got the did document here. So short form did. So what the resolver will do is it will go across and actually um, find the did document. So it's gone onto the iron network right, and found the did document. And we can also, there is a, another option here of, um, so there's our, our public keys sitting in there in this particular case. And with the other thing we can do is we can go to Iron Explorer and Iron Explorer is a way of resolving DIDs. So there's a long form DID and uh, there's the example one that is just given when you start Iron Explorer. It's not published, but it just takes the, the DID document component and displays it, All right? Um, however, we've got our one um, so what we're going to do is just grab our did, but not the not the long um, form version, just the short form version. And what Iron Explorer is going to do is go to the Iron Network and bring back the did document. So it's pulled it back, and it see see you can see it's actually published on the Iron Network. Um, and and also you can see in here that there is associated with the link domain. Um, so we got the public keys, but equally well, the link domain. So it's basically saying this did is linked to this organization. So that uh, uh, link domain is identifying the org. So that, that's, that's dids for us. So we've got our digital driving license, all right? So there's our other one. So let's look at that subject. Subject did, right? Sally's face, who generated this? Sally, well, Sally's wallet did it on her behalf, okay? There's our claims. Where did the claims come from? The issuer set the claims up, okay? And we put the issuer did on there. And then what happens is the issuer signs that, okay? So now that has the signature of the issuer. So when we get this, we know that those claims right, are about this subject, right? and they can't have been tampered with because we've got the, the actual issuer did on there. But we can take it a step further. Why not take this envelope and wrap it in another one? And now, why don't we get Sally to sign this outer envelope? So now when she presents it, Right, the, it says Sally can drive a car, right? Signed by the driving license authority. And guess what? It's Sally presenting it. All right, so, so even if she's cut her hair and changed all sorts of things, we, we now know 100% it's Sally presenting it. And then we take it another step further. And when we're asked to present our digital driving license, this is called a presentation request. We sign this with the did of the authority. So, you know, the did of the police authority or the did of that individual policeman, All right? So we now know who we're presenting our credentials to. And that is a verifiable credential or a verified ID. Okay. Um, so Microsoft um, thing, you got an issuer, you got a holder. Well, we've seen the holder. That's the Microsoft Authenticator app, right? And it's just the standard Authenticator app. You've got an Authenticator app today. You can pick one of these things up as in a verifiable credential. And then you've, you've got a verifier, okay? So we've got this guy. We've got this guy to deal with. This one and this one we need to deal with. This guy is there. It's in the Authenticator app. But there's a, you know, SDK for a wallet. So it's not, it's, you know, it's will be anyone can actually design their own wallet and use it. So there is a software development kit for the wallet. Um, 
<clears throat> lots and lots and lots of things have changed over time. Huge number of things from the initial conception, and I'm sure lots more things will change. When it started, um, this guy, remember, you saw that sort of signing. It's got a digitally signed stuff and everything else. The issuer had to do all the crypto maths, right? So the code for the issuer was complicated. Right? and very heavyweight, so there's a lot of calculation going on. Uh, the verifier uh, had to do crypto maths as well. In fact, the crypto maths on the verifier is worse than for the issuer. The issuer basically needs to get the claims together and sign this thing. Right? The verifier could actually be receiving multiple VCs coming in, verifiable credentials, and they're all being presented as one go. And the signing of all that has all got to be checked. So this was very heavyweight. Those two heavyweight jobs have now been taken in to the actual very very well, the Microsoft verified ID service. So you don't have to do the heavyweight crypto maths anymore. So there's APIs to manage that. Okay. Um, the VCs, uh, they use what's called a display and a rules file. You know, you saw the color of the card, you saw the title, you saw the icon, that goes in a display file. Right? And then the, the names that go underneath it uh, also go in the display file. And then you've got another file, which is the rules definition file, which is how you get your claims. Right, so it, and we'll see how there are lots of ways of getting claims and how we put the claims into the issued VC. So every single card, if you like, in your wallet, to go with it was a display file and to go with it was a, a rules definition file. Those have now been brought into the UX. There's no need to have Azure storage to put those files in. So that's been done as well. Um, and then, um, so they're stored directly into the verified ID service. So if we look at it, what you've got is in the, the Microsoft space, in the Microsoft tenant, uh, you've got a verifiable credential service request API. This is where we request an issuance to be created and a verification to be created. So this is where we go. We'll see that um, uh, shortly in more detail. You've then got the verifiable credential service itself. Now, to be able to work with those, um, you need your own tenant, and inside your own tenant, uh, you need a key vault. That's where your private keys get stored. I, I would like Microsoft to take that key vault and put it in their tenant. Well, actually, I wouldn't like them to use a key vault at all, because key vaults are not brilliant in terms of performance. Right now, if you if you look at Azure AD, you're you've got when you've got an application, you've basically got um, client credentials for the application. And so there's lots of keys and signing and all sorts of things going on all the time. And it would be much nicer if that was actually sitting in the Microsoft space. And it might at some stage, but certainly not for the moment. So that's where our private keys go. And that's where the signing takes place. Um, we need a service principal to represent this guy so that we can actually access this guy in the Microsoft space. We need a service principal to access this guy as well. Okay. And then both of these service principals need permissions to the key vault. Right? So they'll need to be able to get access to the key vault. And if you're not familiar with key vault, think that's where the private key is. Right? And what you do is you don't take the private key out to sign something. What you do is you chuck something into the key vault to get signed. The key never leaves the key vault. Okay. Um, but we need these service principles, which if you like, you can think of as applications to um, which allow it to access the vaults. Then what you'll need is you'll need an app that you define that can actually call the verifiable credential service. And to do that, it will call it with the identity of the service principal. And um, that's uh, we configure the issuer app and the verifier app, which are outside of our tenant. This is our code that we put together. And we configure those so that they can actually call the appropriate services. And they're going to be calling this particular API. 
Um, if you're not familiar with registering applications and everything else, it can get extremely complicated. Um, and uh, actually, I do. I, I have a I have a masterclass where we go into all of the details of that in huge detail. Um, but um, any, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to park it there because we could spend hours on this just this piece. But the key is we we we've got the a bit way of this guy calling into this API and this guy calling into that API. And by creating this environment, uh, they get the appropriate client ID and secret to be able to do that. Okay, um, the apps, um, there's lots and lots of code samples. Um, there's a lot actually in .NET, in Java, in Node. I like writing in Node uh, and Python. Um, I've done a blog which needs a bit of updating because uh, every time I update it, they change yet another thing, and I have to update it again. But actually, it will give you all the principles of how it works, if you're interested. I think it's it's a four-part series. Um, and what I want to do is just give you a little demo of how we set the organization up. And in terms of setting the org up, um, what you do is you give it an org name, all right? That name there. Um, you can change if you don't like the name you choose, all right? You then give it a trusted domain. That is, you're basically saying, this is my domain, all right? So I can publish something into that trusted domain. Um, and then you uh, go in and you, uh, coming down here, you actually go to the key vault and you select a key vault and you have to create a key vault. If you haven't got one, you need to create a key vault in the Azure service. Um, by the way, all of this, um, the verified ID um, service is all free, all right? There's no, currently no charge for it. You can use it with a free tenant. The one thing you do have to have is you need an Azure subscription to get a key vault. And that's why I'd like them to move the key vault out of, you know, as a requirement. But uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. So you need a key vault. So you set your key vault up. And then what you'll need to do is you'll need to decide whether you are did web or you are did iron. All right, so the, those, those are the two bits that we need to decide there. Um, and then there, there's, um, there's one set up using did iron, all right? You, you can't do both. You either do did web or you do did iron. In terms of, and this is where you're anchoring your did documents. You either put the did document on your website effectively, or you put it into the iron network. Um, and and you know, in the future, when it comes to rolling keys and everything else, you'll probably want to put it on on the iron network. Um, and then what you can do is you can actually um, you can register the ownership verification of the domain, and they give you all the documents that you need to upload to be able to do that as well. So it's quite easy to get set up. Um, the, the more challenging bit is how you're actually going to use it and get the issuer app working and the verifier app. Um, where do the claims come from? Good point. So how do we get the claims? The, well, the issuer is going to need the claims, and they could come. And we've seen that statically picked up. So you define them, all right? Give a user a pin, they put the pin number in, bang, the claims are added in, all right? And, and remember that when these claims are added, what will have happened is the holder will have given their did. So those claims are bound to that holder, all right? Another way of doing it is to pull the claims out of an ID token. So if you sign in and you need to sign in with Open ID Connect and you get an ID token from that, you can take claims out of that token and put them into the verifiable credential you're going to issue. So somebody could log into their organization to get them. The next thing we could do is they could actually be asserted by the user. All right, so the user actually puts them in into the authenticator app. And we've used this um, for a conference we did. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun to have, uh, a, yeah, you could put yourself into a prize draw, draw, 
provided you attended a couple of sessions. So when people went to the session, what they had is a QR code, which they picked up, but they also had a swag code. All right, so by attending the session, they were given a particular swag code. So what they did is they scanned, and then in the authenticator, they put the swag code in, they'd just been given in the session, and that produced them a verified credential. We went to another session, did the same, and then at the afterwards, they could present both of those verified credentials in one go, right, as a, present, the, so a presentation request from another site. And that way, if the swag codes were correct, uh, they then had, you know, a chance of being in the swag draw. Um, the other thing is you from other VCs. So just be, if you've got a VC, I've got, oh, I want you to present a true identity VC and a proof of passing an exam VC from trainer XYZ. All right, so we could do that and bring that in. And then the verifier um, can request and it's called the presentation request, could pre request for a single verifiable credential or verified ID to be presented or multiple, right? So you can do that. Um, in terms of creating a new credential uh, through the UX, uh, they give you a little sample here. There's the display definition and there's the rules definition. And just to look at that briefly, here's our display definition and inside, sorry, here's our card and our display, uh, we've got a description which appears down here. It's got issued by which appears over here. We've got a title that is over there and a logo. And I realized that I've actually got the back, the, uh, I think the background color, where's the background color? Yes, the background color, uh, it's an old background color. What color is that? It's Black. Black yes. yes. So instead of gray. <laughs> all right. The text is all Fs, which is white. Um, so if you look at that and think, oh, that's not the background color. You're absolutely right. I obviously, uh, I did. A, I put the slide together wrongly. So, so that's that's the information there. And then what appears here, we have a name, right, which is the name in the authenticator. It's the label. And then we have a value that has actually come out of the verifiable credential. So here, down here, there's our, our claim, and it's the VC, credential subject dot first name. So that this is the VC for this particular thing. That's taken out of the VC, and then that's the label, which is in there. And the same thing happens here. We've got the label, and we've got, um, I, didn't, I shouldn't put those links in, we've got the, the, the label there, and the value out of the VC, All right? So that's how it gets displayed, right? And then in terms of the rules is basically, it's the rules as to how you get these values, all right? Um, and uh, the, these files can you actually get, um, it's using what's called here, ID token hin hints, uh, which is the one where we're going to, um, uh, we're actually filling in, in the information programmatically, but we can actually pull the information out of an ID token. We could pull it out of different VCs, et cetera. And that's what this rule definition file does for you. Um, those two get combined in what's called a manifest, right? And it's also called a contract. So contract manifest is sort of pretty much used interchangeably. And what it has is effectively a summary of the, um, you know, the, the display rules, and it has a summary of the, um, the actual definition rules, right? And there's a, what we have is a URL. So if I say, go and get this particular, you know, um, uh, credential, verifiable credential, I can give you the manifest URL, which completely defines what we need to get. There's a quick start, which makes life very easy. Um, there's verified employee and there's custom credential. And they've got it in gray, so it must be coming soon. <laughs> All right. uh, there's verified faculty and verified student coming soon. So this one, the verified employee, 
um, basically, uh, you have got very little control over it, right? So there's, there's minimal definition file. So you've got the, you, uh, the logo, uh, you've got the text color, the background color, and that's it for, for that bit. So, you know, not the complete list of display rules, just a, a little bit of changing there. And in terms of the actual rules, uh, for putting or get, gathering the claims, uh, they're just taking out of the ID token. So this is where you log into your organization and it gives you back a verified employee which has information that's coming directly out of your organization's database, right? But it's, um, it's an open ID connect, but that, that is actually for coming out of a Microsoft Azure space, right? If you wanna do craft it yourself, then you go for the uh, custom, right? Um, and if you go for custom, you can do anything you like pretty much. So this is the Microsoft uh, example app. It has get credential and verify credential. And that's the, the first web page comes up with that. Um, and then if you choose get credential, uh, he then comes up with, a, you know, it's now running a, another web page where it's got the get credential option. You click on that, and what it does is it goes down to the, this is running Node.js, so it goes down to the issuer um, JavaScript, and it's saying get the access token for the API. Remember the API that we call? We need an access token to prove that we're allowed to use that API. So the first thing is it gets the access token. The next thing it does is it assembles the API request data. And that is basically saying, uh, we're getting a credential, is saying issue this particular type of credential, right? And part of that will be the manifest URL, which says this is the credential. Next thing that happens is we call the API, right? Now, prior to this, you had to do all the work of actually, you know, creating the issuance request and issuing the credential itself all within your code. Now you call out to the API and what the API does is it has a uh, response. And one of the things it can respond with uh, is a URL because basically that QR code is basically a, just a URL. This is where the authenticator needs to go. So if you're running, doing the whole thing on your phone, you don't need a QR code. Um, what you need is a deep link. So that would be the, the deep link that it returns. Um, the, ne the next thing that will happen is you scan this, and then what happens is you're gonna sit there polling for a result. There's gonna be a callback. So when it detects this has been scanned, it tells you. Right? How does it know it's been scanned? It's because the authenticator is going to the Azure service and saying, hey, you know, I've scanned this, I need more information. I need to know what to do. And at that point, this can then say, yeah, you've been scanned. And then it's sitting there polling for results, right? And this then, when it successfully issues the credential and the credential is successfully inside the authenticator, the authenticator says, yeah, I've got it, All right? In which case it calls back again and we finish the job, All right? And, that, and that's, the, that's the basically the issuance flow. Um, you need a, a, this, the issuance request API, uh, which you've got to fill in. I'm not gonna go into the details, but the, the, we've got the callback things there. Would you like a QR code, true or false, All right? Um, and it, it brings it back as, a, as an actual QR code and you just need to display the, I think it comes back as a PNG, but I think there are options. Um, or you can generate your own QR code. Uh, we need the authority, which is um, the, the did iron or the did web. And then we need the type of credential. So the credential URL or the manifest URL and the name of the credential, which in this case is alumni. Um, but the nice thing is the UX actually generates this for you or most of it, right? So all you do is you cut and paste that into your code, 
right? So rather than having to figure out, oh, what on earth do I do here, here, and here, um, you just literally cut and paste that into your code. Um, and then in terms of coming soon, and this is uh, something that's coming along, is the ability to have notifications to your phone. So you can say, hey, this is a credential I want everyone to have. Right? The user's got to be involved in getting that credential because the user may have to log on to get it. Right? They may, if it's self-issued, they may need to put some details in. Right? The user needs to be involved, but basically it appears in the authenticator, come get this, come get this credential. Right? And um, that, that uh, says no code required for issuing the credential. When it comes to um, verifying, we've got the verification service again, very similar, uh, verified credential, get the token, assemble the data, call the API, and then sit there and wait for the response. So now I'll display the QR code. This is for presenting a credential. And then we're polling for results, all right? So as soon as it's been as soon as it realizes the QR code's been scanned, uh, we're getting the, the result back. And then the next job is, again, we're sitting there polling, waiting for this guy now to get that presentation request, the presentation from the authenticator and go through it and verify all the signatures and everything is correct and pull the actual data and the claims out of it. And it returns those and at that, whoops, at that point, um, you can see all the claims that have been returned, right? And, and, that, and that's, that's basically the Microsoft example code that you've got to work with. Um, again, we need to assemble this API request. The most important thing is the credential we want, which is alumni, and the accepted issuers. So it's not nice stopped me having an alumni credential from different issuers. But what I'm saying here is what the is acceptable issuers are. So, you know, we could ask, you know, Eric or John or who, whoever it is for a, a particular credential. And he goes, oh, I've got five in here. All right, they're all alumni because I'm alumni of this and that and the other. Which one shall I present? Well, you can choose which one to present and we can have a list of accepted issuers, right? Um, and again, um, this is very interesting, is that if you have a particular credential that you create, you can publish this credential on a network that's available to everyone. So if you say to me, oh yeah, what you need to do is uh, you need to get my particular uh, you know, allow me to present this particular one. And let's say you're a, a, a um, you know, an issuer. So here is your definition of your credential that you're going to issue, right? So I can pick this up off the network and then know how to verify it. So this is, you know, we got issuer one, issuer two, issuer three, issuer four, issuer five. They can all publish their, what they're going to issue, right? And I go, oh yeah, I need a something from issuer five. And I go onto the network, I get the definition, I can then create a presentation request from that. So um, that, that is uh, potentially very, very powerful that you can pick up all these different ones from different organizations. So this is obviously in different Azure tenants, right, being created. So here we go again, quick start, verification request. We come in here onto the network. Uh, we select the issuer. Having selected the issuer, it gives you the API body that we need to make the call to do the proper presentation uh, request. Um, and then there's a management API as well. Okay, that's, uh, that's pretty good. So again, we need an app to represent it. So there's our service principle to get to the management API. So you can create everything programmatically, right? You don't have to go through the UX. So that's available. And the question is, how do we use these things, All right? And I'm hoping you're thinking, ah, we could possibly use them here or there. But let's say examples. 
identity verification service, right? Um, why not have a college that can present the identity verification service? So now we know that somebody you know, actually has a particular set of credentials from that college. Right? And then what we can do is we could use that uh, for uh, bring a fully proofed user in, including their exam results and all the rest of it. We bring them into our organization and we can onboard a new employee. Or maybe we use it for self-service password reset. To do a part self-service password reset, you need a really strong proof of who you are. So that's another possibility. Or particularly, I, if you, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but the temporary access pass in Azure AD allows you to give a strong authentication code to someone so that they can sign it. If they've left their authenticator, if you're using MFA in your organization, someone's left their authenticator at home or they're going to be onboarded, or they want, they, they've not done MFA at all, and they want to be on board for a FIDO2 key, you can give them a temporary access pass, which will allow them to do that. Right? But, you know, why not have a really strong credential before you can get a temporary access pass? And then in terms of actual access management, access to apps, different applications, um, maybe you have an app where somebody is only allowed to use that app if they've done the cyber awareness training. Okay, so training facilitator gives a cyber awareness VC, says, yes, this person's done it. And then you can come into the access management package, which allows them then to have access. Um, Interoperability is really, really crucial. Um, if you're really interested in this, I suggest uh, you probably join the Decentralized Identity Foundation. You can pay money and have your logo, or you can just join, and you can join working groups and, and feedback information. Um, so they, they've done some amazingly good work. Um, but I, I've also put some other links in, in terms of the VC presentation profile and things. But I, this is an, a really excellent place to start. The other thing is start conversations. You know, this is in its infancy. How could you use it? Talk not to your IT department. Well, talk to your IT department, obviously, but talk to your marketing, talk to your legal, talk to your compliance. Where could it fit in? Right? And where might you really see a benefit from using it? So involve actually absolutely everything to everyone. Talk to partners about it. You know, how could you get a really good ecosystem working between partners using verifiable credentials? Uh, coming soon, I, I got special permission to show this. This is in private preview at the moment. Um, I don't know whether any of you have worked with access packages. Has anyone used governance and access packages in Azure AD? Yeah, so the, the concept is that you have your tenant, right, your Azure AD tenant, you have lots of applications in it, you have lots of groups, you have lots of sites, and you've got a user, and you go, oh, what do they need access to? How do we give them access to everything they need access to? So what you can do is you can generate an access package which has the resources that a user should be allowed access to. And uh, there's an internal user policy and an external user policy. So bringing in a guest, that would be the policy applies, and then gives them access to this lot. Uh, if they're an uh, internal user, again, they come in and get access. The, the beauty, and this is something, this is part of, you need a P2 license because you need governance for this. The beauty of this, it has been designed for delegation. So if you look at it, um, what you can do is create a catalog. So here are all the resources in your organization, right? Here is the legal department. Somebody creates a legal department um, catalog of all the resources that legal could use, right? And those are the resources that are available to the legal department, right? So now we've got a catalog, and then you have an access package manager who could be, you know, the, the, uh, 
the case manager, if you like, and says, OK, you're going to be working with case 101. You need these resources. All right. And if you're working with a different case, you need access to another set of resources. And then you can have um, a, another one, uh, someone as a manager who assigns users. You assign them to this package, they get access to all those resources. Assign them to that one, they get access to all those resources. You remove them from this one, they lose access. So it, it's a, a really good system. And um, let's say the, the real beauty is the ability to do the delegation. And this is what I'm allowed to show you, which is when we come in and we go through, um, uh, we're working, we, what we can do is we can say that to actually request access, you need to provide a particular credential, right? In this case, at the moment, and this will probably get cleaned up, at the moment what you've got is a did and also the uh, credential type which is a true identity credential. Um, and then when a user goes to get access to a package, they can go through a portal called My Access. And when they're in My Access, they can actually be prompted when they choose that particular package for a verifiable credential, right? And this could be the cyber awareness training that we were talking about. So they get their phone out, they scan the QR code, boom, yep, you've, you've got the credential, it's presented, and now you've got access to the access package. Next question is, if you have your credential revoked, could you be removed from the access package? And there's, you know, all sorts of things uh, to be figured out, but it's it's very much a, a work in progress. But I think it's uh, it's potentially a very powerful work in progress, and there's a lot there that could be used. Um, if you want to know more about Zero AD authentication, securing access to your apps, registering apps in a Zero AD, application protocols, Open AD Connect, Auth2, um, the Zero AD application proxy, uh, and a whole lot more, um, I do have this masterclass that I run probably three, maybe four times a year, um, just when I when I got time, I mean, I, I love doing it, um, but it's a matter of finding the t time and space to do it. I, I've not had a single person on it that hasn't absolutely loved it and enjoyed it. If you want to look at the full prospectus, have a look at learn.xtseminars.co.uk. Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to see you on that at some point um, if you're interested. And that brings us uh, to the end. Thank you.